gonna get started here with the drone segment of the uh, field night, and I got to do the introductions. We got um, Mike Lights with Lights Consulting. Um, he is actually going to be having a drone and doing some scouting for Pro Harvest uh, when he does his uh, uh, corn checks and bean checks and different things. Um, and then we actually have with us today Jay Christensen with Drone Works. Drone Works. And uh, he's going to be doing uh, some talking on the drones and doing a demonstration with it and things like that. So, Jay, it's all yours. Mm -hmm. Uh, my name's Jay. I do all the building and the tech work for CropCopter. They're one of the bigger players out there right now in the ag drones. We've been very selective as to what we've chosen as far as a platform's concerned. We we were through several before we settled on this one. The feedback we're getting on this one for the most is it comes in a nice small case. It's ready to fly, throw it in your truck, and it's ready to go. Uh, there are some that are considerably bigger, even even that one right there, even when you take the propellers off, the case is quite large, And uh, but the bigger ones tend to get more flying time. Uh, I don't know if you guys have any specific questions as to what you're looking to have answered. Uh, we've got, you know, the base uses for these are going to be truthing, just get out, see what's going on. And depending on the platforms, as you go up into the bigger platforms, you can carry, carry more sophisticated cameras that'll do everything from thermal to NDVI. And, you know, the, basically the sky's the limit depending on what you want to strap to the bottom of it. Uh, they are, they do all, every single one we have has the capability of flying fully automated from an iPad uh, or a laptop. You can fly it by hand and just skirt around and see what's going on if you've got specific areas you want to do. You can set waypoints. I, th I think you're allowed to set up to 50 waypoints. Again, depending on the platform and the battery, some may not have the ability to get out that far and back. They've got about a mile range in the base package. We do have packages that will get up to 10 miles and up to this, like the, the one we've got over there with the dual battery configuration on that one that will that is capable of 45 minute flight times so you can basically and then it's got quite a lifting capacity too uh, i don't remember off the top like i said i usually do the tech side of things i'm the building and all that the the sales guys are usually the one that have the whole uh the whole presentation set up but i think with that one i want to say that it's capable of lifting about five pounds on five or six pounds on top of itself and uh, this one's pretty much limited to the GoPro. Uh, but again, it's just a matter of how much you want to do on one battery. Uh, everybody keeps stressing as to how much, how you want, you know, the more flight time, the better. And that is, the, that is good to a point. But when it takes a Velcro strap, pull a battery out, put it in, plug it in, strap it in, and go, you know, you're on the ground for less than a minute to change batteries. Uh, so it just depends on what's most important to you. Uh, there, I don't know if you guys want to step up. You can see I've got, you know, I've got some video running here that I took of. We had some bad seed rows at a farm outside of Gibson here a while back. That Is that Pioneer? <laughs> no, actually, I don't even know. I don't even know what it was. Uh, <clears throat> but um, I mean, you feel free to pick it up and play with it. I mean, they're not real heavy. They're not real big. They're, uh, they are very easy to fly. Uh, I joke around telling people that a monkey can fly them. I don't know that I would literally hand it to a monkey, but I've had guys that have never touched anything other than a radio control car from Radio Shack that I've got them up flying by themselves inside of a battery or two. Um, when you're flying on the iPad, there's not really a whole lot to it. You just have to know how to set waypoints in the, in the software itself. You press go and it does its thing. So that, that's really all there is to it. If you look at the motors on these, these motors on here get their horsepower from a higher RPM. These spin at, this is what they call, this is almost a thousand kV motor. And what you do is you get, the, what a kV means is it's RPMs per volt. So if you've got a 14 volt battery, you do the math and you've got a higher high spinning motor. This is a 400 kV motor. It's very small, very wide, it's got a lot of torque. These, these spin at about a third of the RPMs of those. The way I explain this to people is this is like your Honda Civic this is like your diesel okay you're gonna get 
And that, so what it's doing is you're taking great big props and swinging them at a low RPM to get sustained flight time out of it, whereas you're getting higher RPM and more responsiveness. This one's going to be more sluggish, but it's going to fly a lot longer, and it's going to be very stable because it's, a, it's got a lot wider platform. It's not going to move like this as fast. Uh, Jay, with the wind factor, though, but with the, it, if you're flying automated, you can handle those winds. If you're the, trying to fly it manually. Manually automated doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Where, the wind, where the wind will start playing is when you start moving more air, or if you've got, like I'm sure you've all seen the bigger drones, the ones that are real big and they stand that high off the ground, it's like a kite. The more surface area you've got, the more the wind's going to affect it. These are so low profile. We've been out at a couple of shows where guys won't even put their drones up in the air because they're so unstable with the wind and these things will fly them around all day long. Uh, but it's basically just a matter of, it, it, each package is a little bit different. But no, but to answer your question directly, this thing would be, Optimum for flight time, 10 mile an hour, 12 mile an hour winds or less. 15, 17 mile an hour winds, no issue. When you start hitting the 20 mile an hour point, yeah, you can fly, sure. You're gonna, because it, once it's locked into the GPS, all you're doing is moving the stick. I mean, it may, it may fly, it may bank into the wind like this, but it's gonna hold its position and stay there, okay? So the stronger the wind, the less flight time is basically all there is. But you can fly in, in very substantial winds if you need to. Recharge time for a battery. One hour. Yeah, you can charge them. <coughs> excuse me. You can charge a little bit faster depending on your charger. The base charger that comes with it, it's going to be one hour per battery. That's the safe charge rate. Uh, the battery with, with the right charger are capable of being able to be charged in about 30 minutes. Uh, and that's after use because some of those batteries you get they get hot and you don't want to you don't want to these don't these hot. don't get they'll get a little warm but they shouldn't get too hot if you're if they're getting that hot hot it's flying really hard they might be a little lithium batteries generally will get a little warm to touch but they're not like the old NICAD batteries we're used to where they get toasty to the point where you don't want to even hold them so all right well let me uh who can fly them? Okay, there's the million dollar question I was waiting for. Uh, everybody can fly them right now. There is a gray area of a dividing line, and even the gray area is open to interpretation. As a hobby, for you to buy this and say, I'm going to go out in my backyard and I'm going to fly around and play, anybody can do that. I can't go to you and say, for X amount of dollars, I'll fly your field. It, that, that is black and white but where what most guys are using these for is I equate it to the city worker that has to go out and dig a hole. I've got a shovel and I've got a backhoe. What do you care what I use? Okay. I can't charge you more for the backhoe, but if it makes my job easier, I can use it. Um, there's been, Mike and I were having this conversation on the way up here. The big question right now, everybody wants to know what the FAA is doing. They're and this is purely my opinion, but we've done some research into this, and I really think what they're doing is they're the big barking dog trying to mark their territory right now. They, I think what's happening is they've got an idea in mind of what they want to do. And if they just came out with this and said, this is what we're going to do, everybody's going to be mad. If they get everybody all worked up and scared that they're going to outlaw this or they're going to do that or going to do that, and then they come out with that same ruling, everybody's like, Phew. Uh Realistically, in the long run, I think what, what we're most likely to see out of this is a licensing fee. To do it commercially, you're going to have to, the FAA wants their cut. This is, I mean, they're talking about this being a $10 billion a year industry within the next handful of years, and they want their hand in the cookie jar. So realistically, I think what's going to happen is there's going to be, whether it be a yearly, a bi-yearly, a once in a who knows. Don't know what it's going to be, but there's probably going to be some sort of fee that they're going to charge for you to be able to go out and say, I'm a commercial UAV pilot. And that's probably the direction that we think it's going to go. What about in that situation where we have everybody here has, has drones, cross signals? Won't happen. Each one, run. Yeah. They... <laughs> on a much, on a, it's it's working on a much much more sophisticated scale, but think about it like your garage door opener. You got two garage door openers; they're both working the same way, but they lock onto a frequency. What they do is see we've got two different radio systems on here that are 2.4 gigahertz. You've got your radio that controls the aircraft, and then you've got your automated portion which can which talks to the iPad. But what they're doing 
is each one finds its signal to lock onto, and once it finds that signal, it doesn't move. It stays there and it ignores everything else. Uh, so you can, I mean, you could have 30 people running shoulder to shoulder with these things, and the only thing that's going to crash is them running into each other, not their radios. So. But there should. Person, if they wanted to, especially out here in the countryside, and, and uh, say he wanted Wi-Fi everywhere in this, this farm unit, mm -hmm. could you put one up? Wi-Fi is bad. Be the reason being, Wi-Fi is also a 2.4 signal. The reason that Wi-Fi is bad for these is that, as opposed to, compared to the radio, where you're locking on to two signals, Wi-Fi is just a broad blast. It's a broad blast 2.4. Uh, same thing with these, like the, this is actually our video transmitter. This is what sends the video back to the screen. We run this on 5.8 so it doesn't interfere with the radio. There are 2.4 systems that will get you much more range on the video out to several miles, but you can't use them with these radio systems. You have to use it with a UHF radio system that, depending on which license or which one you get, some of them do require a, ham, a basic ham license to operate. I mean, that, that was a great You idea. could, you just don't want to fly, just don't want to fly your quad. Any tower you wanted, yeah. just repeater. There, there, there are some very basic, more hobby level drones that do run on Wi-Fi that guys have done that where they've set up Wi-Fi repeaters around an area, but they're, it's, it's more of a hobby grade. Okay. So, any other questions? Cost. Uh, base package on this one with a single charger and two uh, two batteries runs right in the neighborhood of about, I want to say it's about 56 to 58. The most popular package we sell, uh, by the time you get into either a dual or a four port charger with additional batteries, we've also got a little, it's a little trainer copter that's about that big that you can fly around your living room. Uh, runs on the same radio and everything. The most popular package we're selling is running right up and right up around 65. And that's with the Go, that's with a GoPro black camera and extra props, the whole nine yards. I realize we had audio too. So the first thing generally you have to do is calibrate these. Generally you don't want to do it standing by a truck. Metal tends to be bad for compasses. There's, there's different color flashes. What it's doing right now is it's looking for the GPS. It's looking for a satellite lock. When the red light goes completely away is when it's when it's got the whole thing and when it's got all the uh, satellites in view. So now we're ready to go. See how it's tilted, the screen is tilting back and forth? That tells you the attitude of the aircraft. Now if I switch to the other camera, oh, you can't get it here. yeah, I just switched to the GoPro. Now you see how it's not really moving. So that right there, when it's in a GPS lock, it'll just sit there all day long. Until you tell it to do something different, it'll sit there. So the other thing we do, one of the rules that the FAA puts out there is that you're not allowed to go above 400 feet, okay? How high are you? Right now, I'm guessing I'm probably 150 feet. And so you'll see, it'll, it'll stop at 396 feet. Oh, it'll stop, oh, okay. <laughs> when we fly, when I fly a field, 
generally I'm flying about this altitude right here. I'm about 150 to 200 feet. So one of the cool things about this also, this stabilized camera gimbal, get into a nice lock here. Of course, birds, birds are lots of fun, especially ones that don't like flying other flying objects. So, when I bring this thing back a little bit, if you watch the camera, even when I move back and forth, see how the camera is stabilized? So you can, the nice thing about these is that when they're easy if you're flying along and you just say, oh, I don't know what's going on, you just let go of the stick. And as long as you're at a mid stick, it's just going to sit there and it's going to hover. I mean, that's full stick. And then I let go of it and it just stops. Okay? So, let me bring this down and then I'll... Now, if it goes, for some reason, gets out of range... Does it have an automatic where it'll come back to its origination? Yes, I, I set the the maximum distance is one and a quarter miles. It will not go any further than that if it hits, if it hits that distance and doesn't receive any other input from the radio, it will return to home. So now what we'll do is we'll run a quick automated flight. So basically, what this does is it brings up what Google Earth, Jay. Yeah, it, it integrates with Google Earth, and it will, like, so what it's going to do right now is it's actually going to bring up this field. Okay, so it just brought up the field, and now... I'm just going to run a fairly small pattern here right now just so that... So what we have, then what we have to do is go and select the height that we want to fly. Okay. So now what I did was I just uploaded it. It went wirelessly from, from here off to the aircraft, okay? So now all we have to do at this point, now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have this just in my hand just for safety. We hit go. Now it's heading off to point number two. Now you also have the ability at any time to abort the mission right from the radio. By flipping a switch, by flipping a switch you can take control of the aircraft again. So all I'm doing here is just running a basic box. So you set up a GPS for the field, the perimeter of the uh -huh. field, or whatever area you want. Yep, and once you set once you set it up the first time, you can save it, and you don't have to go through setting it. Now this time, I forgot to turn off the loop, so it's going to keep going around in circles. Okay. Oh, okay. But yeah, that was an easy so pack. if I want to what a, to get control of it again, now all I'm going to do is please before you have it, otherwise you're just going to sit there. And so right there, I have control of it again now. Okay. If you want to return to home, it'll go into a full automated return to home. I generally recommend to people try try learning how to land by hand if you can. Uh, 
it'll turn around, it's gonna come back, and it's gonna come back and land right where it took off from, or fairly close to it. You always wanna leave yourself a little bit of leeway. You don't wanna, you know, don't leave yourself two feet on either side. Find yourself an area where you've got 10, 15 feet on either side. It is, but what it's doing right now is You never have too many toys. <laughs> no. So that's it. These are called boy, big boys' toys. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? I know there were a couple of late, couple of late arrivals. There is a little bit of information up here. I didn't get a chance to grab a whole lot. There are some brochures up here if you're interested. Um, basically, they're, it, they seem very intimidating. They're not, they're not hard to fly at all. Uh, it's, it's a very simple process. It does take a little bit of getting used to. One of the nice things that this does do, there is a simulator mode on the iPad that you can take this thing and you can take the props off and just set it outside and you can play with all the settings and it from here if you weren't watching this from here that looks exactly what it what it should be doing so they actually let me out of the workshop today <laughs> thank you sure thing <laughs>